I'm going to be reading from Genesis 3, verses 8 through 9. Genesis 3, verses 8 through 9. Somebody said, yes, Minister Jonas is here. He's not long-winded. He's going to let us out on time. I don't know how the Spirit moves. I don't know. Genesis 3, verses 8 through 9. Then the man and his wife heard the sound. Everybody say sound. Of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called the man and said, where are you? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Thank you for being a God who searches after us. We thank you for being a God who asks questions that he already knows the answers to. But most of all, we thank you for being a God that sacrificed. You give all of yourself to us. Father, we pray that we can give all of ourselves to you. We ask you to speak through me, Lord. Let not the enemy distract our minds from your word. Let it not come back to you void. Let it go into our mind and straight down into our hearts so we can manifest that word in the real world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. So... Early this week, I got a call from the church to say, Jonas, we need you to preach on Sunday. I said, don't worry, I got you. I got a word from God. And I really had something that the Holy Spirit has been brewing in my spirit, so I really had something. And, and the instructions, I was voluntold. You know when you're voluntold, they tell you to do stuff. I was voluntold to preach about one of three things or all these three things Holy Spirit, prayer, and saturation, right? So I think I know a lot about the Holy Spirit and prayer, but the word saturation was, was giving me problems. I was like, I don't really know what that is. So I looked it up. The word saturation means the state or the process that occurs when no more of something can be absorbed. The state or the process that occurs when no more of something can be absorbed. So when something has been totally given to something else and it's absorbed, the process of it being absorbed completely is saturation. So I said, I got that. But you know, the Holy Spirit has a funny way of changing your paradigm about stuff. You ever had it when you thought one way about something and then something happens and it just changes the way your perspective is about that thing? Like you thought LeBron James was the greatest player in the world, and then you saw Michael Jordan, and now you understand that LeBron James is the greatest. No, he's not. So I had a paradigm shift because of a meeting that I had this week with this young man. I had an opportunity to meet with this young man at IHOP. His name is Daniel. He's 19 years old. I think he's, he's in the, the sanctuary this morning. What's up, Daniel? Give it up for Daniel, everybody. He's over there. I'm going to embarrass him. So he's only 19 years old, and he texts me. He said, hey, I'm 19 year old. I'm in the church. I, I, I need a mentor, and I just want to talk to you. So I said, fine. I can just go ahead and talk to you. He said, and I'm going to give you free lunch. I said, hey, brother, you speak in my love language. Let's go and have some lunch. Free and food is my favorite two F words. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Next to fun, fantastic. That's the word. So I'm there, I'm listening to him, and he's like, yeah, I'm doing this for the Lord. I'm preaching. I'm, I, I'm, I'm a comedian and everything like that. I said, man, you're doing amazing. He's just on fire for God. I'm looking at him, and I'm like, man, I see myself. I remember when you just first got in the, in, in the Lord, and you're just so on fire for God. I'm just so happy just seeing how on fire for God he is. And then he asked me a question, Ramsey, that nobody has ever asked me before, but I thought myself. He asked me, I'm doing all these things. I just want to know what's the next step. And so I was like, you know, we all have that question in our mind. Like, what's the next step? Is it just going to church, reading your Bible, doing this and that? Like, what's the next step to this Christian life that we have? So my answer to him was a typical Christian answer. My answer was this, get more of God, right? Right? That's what we say. The next step of God is to get more of him, right? That's what we say. If somebody has an attitude, you know what? You need more of what? God. If somebody got a stank breath, you know what? You need more of what? God. 
they don't pay for the dinner, man, you need more of God, right? Because that's what we were trained to say. The Holy Spirit, and you know, you, you know as I know, sometimes you say something and the Holy Spirit just punches you in the gut, says, uh-uh, that's not right. So I just want to say, Daniel, I gave you the wrong answer. It's not that you need more of God. The Holy Spirit talked to me that day afterwards and was like, you gave him the wrong answer. He doesn't need more of God because I've already given all of me already. See, when we say things like, I need more of Jesus or I need more of God, what we're really saying is God has only given us a little bit of grace. He's only given a little bit of mercy. He's only given half of his son's blood to cover our sins. So really what we're waiting for is God to give us more of what he's holding out. But the Holy Spirit says, hold up. So I sent my son to die for you on the cross. I sent the Holy Spirit to be your counselor. I've given you fruits that you can manifest in the world. I've given you gifts. I've given you blessings. I've done all of that and you still asking more of me? What more can I give that I have the not already given? It's like sometimes my beautiful wife, she'll say, I, you, I just feel you don't love me today. I'm like, woman, I gave you my last name. <laughs> what more can I give? My blood. The Holy Spirit, it's a selfish statement. I know why we say it. I get it. But it's a selfish statement. The Holy Spirit has given you everything. All my promises are yes and amen. All the treasures is right here in front of you. What more can I give? The world as it stands cannot receive any more God. All God is is already poured onto the world until it restructures itself to receive more. So God has already given all of himself. You have all the God you need for the rest of your life right now. Now, if you are non-believer and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ, then that statement is true for you. You need more of Jesus because you don't have Jesus. But if you're a believer right now, let me tell you, you have all of God that you will ever need in your life. So the problem isn't that we need more of Jesus, Ramsey. The problem is that we need to give more of ourselves. So the next step, the title of my message is Level Up. Wow. It's not the Sierra version, it's the Holy Spirit version, amen. But the next step of your Christian walk is to give more of yourself. Because what we do is we say, God, I surrender all. This is us. This is God. God, I surrender all, but we only go halfway in. We say, God, I surrender all, but I'm withholding some things. But when you are truly saturated, God, you say, God, I surrender all of myself into your prayer life. I surrender all of myself in your mercy. Because what happens is when you surrender all and the world squeezes you, all it gets is God. Right? You want to be so much saturated, giving of yourself daily, that when life troubles happen and it squeezes you, all they get is worship. All they get is prayer. All they get is victory. All they get is the promises of God. The problem is we're not really surrendering. So because we are irresponsible, we want God to give more of himself when he already has. Oh, the pressure of giving of yourself. So God told me the next step. If you want to level up, if you want to have a different worship, a different prayer life, is to give more of yourself because I've already given you everything. So this morning, if you would have me and just pay attention, I would like to give you a few things that the Holy Spirit has spoke to me about, about having a saturated prayer life. How can you give so much of yourself into prayer that you start manifesting that thing that God has put inside of you? Amen? All right, so I see this, and I'll say this too. One of the worst things in life as a believer is to die knowing that you still could have given God more. 
I don't want to be on my deathbed saying, God, I could have given you more. I don't know what I was waiting for. I don't want that prayer. I don't want that fact to be for you. So we find in Genesis chapter 3 is the very famous story, is the story of the fall. It's a story when we see that Lucifer, the deceiver, deceived Eve. Amen. He had to deceive the woman, right, to go ahead and disobey God. And Eve then in turn brought along Adam, her husband, to disobey God. Now, in verses 8, we hear something. I should say we read something very, very interesting. It says, then the man and his wife heard the sound. Everybody say sound. I'm going to say it again. Then the man and his wife heard what? A what? The man and his wife heard a sound. The man and his wife heard a sound. The man and his wife heard a sound, and they knew it was the Lord. I'm going to say it again. The man and his wife heard a sound, and they knew it was the Lord. Stay with me. I don't know about you, but I don't like to complicate things. So I'm going to use what my teacher would say. Um, keep it simple, stupid. K-I-S-S. -S -S. I don't know everybody ever heard that before. So I'm going to keep my explanation stupid. Prayer, the simplest form of definition of prayer is a conversation with God, communicating with God. I didn't go to a fancy school, right? I didn't go to Morehouse. I didn't go to fam you where you at? I didn't go to VCU. I didn't go all these fancy you, fam you. I heard, I heard somebody go, oh, yes, I know, I know. I didn't go to all those fancy schools, but if anybody ever went to a communications class, the teacher would tell you communication is only 7% verbal and 93% what? Nonverbal. That means that we communicate more nonverbally than we do verbally. That means when you communicate, you say more things for what you're not saying than when you're actually talking. Here's another simpler explanation. God has given us two eyes to see, two ears to hear, and one mouth to talk. That means we're supposed to talk less and listen more. You guys are with me. So a good communicator knows that in order to really communicate, they got to listen to the things not being said. And if you don't listen to the body language, if you don't listen to the tone, then you have fault of not listening and missing the whole thing. Let me give you a real world example. I remember one day I was watching a movie with my wife. I think it was, I don't know, just a comedy, something like that. But I noticed as the movie start, she hasn't said anything. She haven't laughed at any of the jokes. She's just sitting down with her hands folded like this with one of her stank faces. So in my spirit, I felt there was something wrong. So I asked her, baby, you okay? Guess what she said? She did, first she did this. She said, I'm fine. And the movie went on. Still, I'm cracking up nothing. I said, baby, you all right? Now she did, and she rolled her eyes. I said, I'm fine. Now, a good communicator would know the word I'm fine does not mean I'm fine. It means that you did something wrong. You should already know what you did wrong. I can't believe you asked me I'm fine because you know what you did. Because she communicated non-verbally. Come with me, come with me, come with me. Adam and Eve were so in tune with God that God didn't have to say a word. They knew it was God just by the sound of something walking in the woods. They said, that's God. Do you know God sounds? Do you know when God is speaking to you when he's not speaking? <laughs> Do you know what God is saying? See, the problem is that we have such a hard time wondering, when are you going to speak to me, God? When are you going to speak to me, God? God has already spoken to you by his word through circumstances. But we're still not listening to God because we have to wait for somebody else to tell us, this means stop, and this means come here, and this means wait. God is already talking to you. You know when God talks to you sometimes, he's already stating something that he's already said. 
You don't want to be like that man. There was a man that was in a flood, and, and he was on the rooftop of his house, and he was praying to God for God to save him. God, and he was like, God, please, please come and save me. A boat came by and said, you need help. He said, no, I'm praying for God. A helicopter came by and said, you need help. No, I'm praying for God. Somebody came by with another boat and said, no, I'm praying for God. The man died and went up to heaven and said, God, what happened? I thought you were going to save me. God said, I did. I sent you a helicopter. I sent you a boat. I sent you another boat. But you're not listening. Listen, 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 listen. A saturated prayer life is a full contact sport. It's not just what you say, it's what you do. Your life becomes a prayer. See, when God, God is the ultimate communicator because he listens to what we say and also what we do. So when we are praying prayers like, I surrender all, or Lord, I have faith for you to do it in this or that, and you're not living out what you're saying in your prayers, God is saying, I'm not answering that prayer because you're telling me that you don't want it. Your faith is already telling me that you don't want it. Don't just give me your words. Give me your actions. A saturated prayer life matches their words with their actions because that's how you communicate. What are some things that God is communicating with you this morning? What is he saying without his words? They heard a sound. And they knew that's the Lord. When you know God so intimately that you know his sounds, nobody could fool you. That's why when the devil tried to spit verses at you, Jesus was like, get behind me, Satan. That don't sound like God. You may use scripture, but I know the sound of God. Get to know the sounds of God. Get to know how he's moving in the world. Get to know things that he's doing that he could only do. See, I walk around sometimes, and when I see at my job, things, certain things are, are being in place and things like that, I'm like, that's you, Lord. I know I'm watching you. I'm moving with you. God don't have to speak for him to sell you something. He could show you things right now. So they knew the sound of God, and they knew it was God. The second thing of a saturated prayer life is you have to have what pastor called kavanah. Kavanah in Hebrew means intentionality, right? It's rhythm, okay? The Bible said that God came in the cool of the day in the garden. That means he came at a certain time and he came at a certain place. He came at a certain time and he came at a certain place. In your prayer life, you have to be intentional about your prayers. You have to choose a time and a place to give yourself to God. Again, remember, saturation, a prayer life is you giving yourself to God because he's giving you everything. So you have to know that the most important time of your day is the time you spend with the Lord. Do not negotiate your time with God for anything or anybody. I don't care how fine they look. I don't care how much money you're going to make. I don't care what the opportunity is, you have to respect that time. Make it an intentional prayer so you can get your rhythm. Because what happens when you get your rhythm, it becomes a part of you. When you stop doing it, you feel something's awkward. When you stop praying at a certain time in a certain place, you feel something awkward. See, the garden represented for Adam where he met his family. The garden represented where he worked. The garden represented where he chilled. So your garden could be your car. It don't have to be your house. You could be driving and spending time with God. Set your clock. This is the time I'm going to spend with God. I, I, I just recently finished what I call the 30-day challenge. I, I spent 30 days running a mile every day. And I found that when I kept on doing it, it was hard in the beginning. But as soon as I kept on time, that rhythm, it got easier and easier and easier. So much so, if I don't run a mile at least twice or three times a week, I feel weird. I feel awkward. It's that rhythm. We don't have no rhythm in our prayer life. We don't want to be intentional because we want the world to put so much inside of us that God don't have no room. So that rhythm that you get. Because in order to catch up with God, Ramsey, you got to slow down. In order to catch up with God, you got to slow down. You got to go at his pace. I remember I was running one morning, 
and I was just running and I was running because I had to hurry up. I had meetings to go to and the Holy Spirit, stop, slow down, stop. I don't want you to run anymore. I want you to walk. Walk with me. When's the last time you walked with God? See, the, the, uh, the older saints, they know how to walk for long distances. They remember before we had all these fancy, you know, cars and everything like that. My island folks know what I'm talking about. They'll walk from here to, I don't know, Windermere. They just walk. But they also be walking with somebody. And the person they walk with, no matter who they are, becomes their best friend. When you walk with God, you know he'll tell you things that you never knew. I'm telling you right now, when you walk with God, things that you need for your business Things that you want in your relationship life, he'll tell you secrets that you never would have known unless you spend that time. And what's an amazing thing, scripturally, we see that God was in the garden with Adam. Fast forward, Jesus Christ comes, and they call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus Christ dies, ascends, says, I'm going to leave you a comforter. Comforter in the Greek means paraclete, which means somebody who comforts, somebody who walks alongside. Then he says even better, I'm not just going to walk alongside you. I'm going to live inside of you. So when you are walking with God, you literally have God inside of you. And he's saying, I just need some time. I just need some time with you. The Holy Spirit is the person that we lie to the most. Because he's with you all the time. So anytime you're lying to anybody else, you can fool everybody else, but you can't fool the Holy Spirit because he's there with you. He'll say, I know you didn't say that. I was there. I was there. But you need to find that rhythm with God that lives inside of you. Because once you do that, then you really start knowing who God is. I remember when I first got encountered with religion or God or anything. I was a little boy, and I remember praying prayers like this. God, what's your favorite color? Everybody ever do that? What's your favorite song? When we were a child, we had the concept of wanting to know who God was, not getting things from him. It's when we got older, we started changing our prayers from I want to know you to I I need something from you. When we were children, we wanted to see his face. When we got older, we just seek his hand. You cannot know who God is if you don't seek his face. When you start having those rhythmic prayers, those daily devotionals, it could be anywhere. Your garden could be your job. Your garden could be your bathroom. Anywhere. You start to ask God about personality things. Because sometimes we confuse what God does for us for what, who God is. His attributes. He's forgiving. You don't know God is forgiven until you've been forgiven. He's merciful. Until you get mercy, you don't know he's merciful. So in that prayer time is when you really get to know God. Adam has such a relationship with the Lord that he knew God by his sound. He had a time and place where he met God, and he was so involved with God. He saturated in prayer. My last point is the last question that God asks Adam, and I'm going to ask you. God asked mankind the first question. He said, Adam, where are you? You see, the ironic thing about this story is God asks questions he already know the answer to. So when God asks you a question, it's not for you to answer, but really for you to self-reflect. You see, in one moment, Adam was in the garden talking with God. A couple verses later, he's in the bushes hiding from God. And this shows me that you can only be one of two places with the Lord. Either you could be walking in the garden with him, conversing with him, communicating with him, knowing him, or you could be hiding in the bushes from him. And I want to tell you, it's hard to hide from somebody who knows all your hiding spots. God knows everywhere you're going. He knows what you've done. He's seen everything. He's heard everything. And guess what? He still loves you. Stop running away from God this morning. Come back to the Father. He paid a price so he could talk to you in your garden. He paid a price so you won't have to hide no more. There's nothing that you could do that would tell him any different but that I love you. Let us talk this morning.
So if you want to have a saturated prayer life, stop holding on to things that you need to let go. God has already given you everything you need to do the work that he has for you. All you have to do is give yourself. If you receive the word this morning, give God a clap and worship. Amen and amen.